today. We're going to continue many discussions that we've had around ag tech, and I know some of you in the room have worked in that sector already. So our guests are here today from Rice Dairy LLC, which is a dairy brokerage firm based in Chicago, and I had the chance to meet Brian at the Economic Club of Chicago, and he, unlike many people in the city, was speaking our language of some of the things that we're doing down here in Precision Ag and some of the things that are happening in risk management and finance. Both of them have a financial background. So Peter Turk is the co-owner of Rice Dairy, and he started his career in the commodities industry, at like Staley Commodities, agriculture clearing firm, and he had a variety of roles, including as principal and vice president of sales and business development for the Iowa Green business. And then Brian, who I said earlier met and invited to join us here on campus, is founder and co-owner of Rice Dairy, and he started his career at First American Corp, a trading company of the Iowa Grain Company, uh, before coming to Rice Dairy in 2002. I'm going to let them tell you more about their experiences and how they launched and bootstrapped this company to be, as you can see, a growing team that is working in the dairy industry to add additional assessment of risk and trading capabilities to provide value proposition in the market. So please join me in welcoming our guests today. Thank you, Peter and Brian. Thanks, Laura. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Rice. Uh, glad to be here. It's really awesome. I'm, my head is still spinning. Laura took us around to a handful of places. This is a really cool spot. One of those spots you go to and you're kind of like, how did I not know this existed before I came here? So we came in here with an open mind, wanted to learn about what's happening here, meet some of the folks that are here. Um, I'm a, a Chicago guy, right? So I didn't grow up on a farm or anything like that. But I did grow up in the futures industry in Chicago. You've got currently the CMB group, which is here. Uh, but a little history, for the first 100 years or so of that company, they were the smaller of the Crosstown rivals. There was the uh, Chicago Board of Trade, which was formed in the 60s. Uh, Mercantile Shape was formed in the 1890s. And like I say, for over 100 years, the Merc was the smaller, lesser, less cool, not as good business. I mean, they were just the smaller one. And all of a sudden, in the early 2000s, the CME surpassed the Board of Trade and wound up buying them. So, what was the difference? What happened all of a sudden? Was it product mix? It was technology, right? The CME, which spent so many years behind, embraced electronic trade and they embraced technology before the Board of Trade did, they did it better. And they wound up crushing and buying their competitor. Now, the Board of Trade did okay, they sold for a nice amount, but they got eclipsed. Uh, and technology was the main difference there. So, our world that Pete and I both grew up in was the exchange traded world in Chicago. Um, and Chicago is the, the birthplace of the modern day futures markets as well. If you go back through history, there was the concept of futures trading going back in the 1400s in Japan, going back in the 1500s in, in Amsterdam. But it was the Chicago model that came out of the 1860s, which was centralized clearing, guaranteed by groups of clearing firms, that is the model that the whole world operates on today, that many trillions of dollars of derivatives clear through every day. Whether it's Singapore or Frankfurt or in Brazil, those are all used in the Chicago clearing model. Um, let me start by talking about our, our business today that Pete and I own and run. Uh, it's really made up of three divisions. And our core division on rice dairy is risk management focused for the dairy industry. Okay, so when we uh, started working in the industry, or at least myself, there's a lot of firms that are generalists. Okay, so ADM has a clearing house and they can handle all types of commodities. They've got some specialty in the grain markets and ag. Um, we wanted to build a company that was just focused on the, on the dairy complex. And what was interesting as an opportunity for us is that dairy derivatives did not exist before the 1990s. Um, the price of milk, dairy is milk that comes from the cow, and then from that milk there are thousands of different things that are made, from cheese to butter to ice cream. Um, dairy prices, milk prices, had been controlled by the government. Okay? 
and in the 1985 Farm Bill, they deregulated that pricing program. And there was two policy tiers that did it. There was a support, a very high support price. The government would support the prices. And then number two, they controlled the amount that could be produced through a quota system. So those are the policies they deregulated. They took away the quotas, they took away the support prices, and instead of the government governing the price of milk, the price of milk is now governed by supply and demand, like the grain markets are. Uh, and as supply and demand now dictates the price of milk, introduces natural as the sun is going to rise and set, you introduce volatility. <clears throat> so this whole dairy supply chain, uh, which is the largest food commodity on earth, uh, in, in dollar terms. Okay, so in the United States, it's not quite as big as corn uh, or beef. It's right behind it, and they're actually very tied to it. Uh, the dairy herd is one of the largest consumers of corn in the U.S., and one-third of the beef industry comes from dairy cows, so they're very closely connected to it. The dairy, the, the milk crop that is harvested, it's just our static background. Uh, there's no slides or anything. This is all time. Um, Dairy is the largest food commodity on earth. It was something that allured both Pete and I to that market. Um, and both of us had an experience in grain trading companies.
The way milk gets priced in the United States is extremely complicated, way over-engineered, way over-complicated, um, which is job security for us, but it makes it really hard for a dairy farmer to figure out how to manage his risk. Step one in managing your risk is understand what your risk is with precision. You don't just wing it, because there's a lot of money at stake here. Understand what your risk is with precision. That was really hard to do. We had an easy time doing that with a corn farmer in our old days. We go to the dairy farmer. Um, it's like you need a, a math degree from, from here in Champaign in order to understand how the milk track works. So that was the challenge. We were working with dairy farmers and managing their risk. Measuring their risk was really difficult. So we built math models. We hired mathematicians. And ultimately, we decided there was a business in it. We turned it into software. Uh, our software business is called Vault. Uh, VaultDairy.com. Um, it is in a breed of software called CTRM, Commodity Training and Risk Management Software. Uh, integrations are a huge piece of what we're doing to make sure we're pulling the data that the farm has already thrown off. And this software is allowing the dairy farmer to manage his risk with accuracy, but also it's got a two-year forward-looking financial projection. So it's really for farmers that want to, they, it's helping increase their decision making and capital allocation when they're thinking about, should I invest $3 million in a robotic barn? Uh, that's a big investment decision. It helps to have real-time living, breathing, budgeting software, uh, which we have as well. So brokerage and risk management is the first one. Software is our second one. And the third one, which we started last year, was an insurance business. Uh, since the 1990s, there have been crop insurance run through the USDA's RMA division. Uh, last year, that came to the dairy industry. They created a what's called a DRP, Dairy Revenue Protection. It's administrated by the USDA. Um, it, it reprices every single day based on the CME futures that we trade and broker. It's essentially a subsidized put option. Uh, there are dairy farm customers would buy through us through the brokerage company, but they get to do it through the USDA now. Really compelling for the dairy farmers. The uptake has been staggering. Um, about 10% of the U.S. milk crop has been hedged through this program since it launched in October. Um, we're fortunate. We were an early mover. Uh, we are. We've, we're the leading firm in the space right now. We think there's a lot more growth to it in crop insurance amongst the row crop like soy and wheat and corn. Uh, crop insurance is used by 95%. In the U.S., dairy we're at 10 percent right now. I think we're on target to get up there. It's that useful little tool. We think the bankers are going to require it, um, and it ties back into our software. It ties back into our core brokerage because the dairy farmers that are buying this insurance can optimize that insurance by using exchange traded positions against it. And the software helps them measure all of the things in real time to see net net where they are. Um, so that's the. That's where we stand today. Uh, you want to kind of go through some yeah, personal history? Yeah, maybe just tie it a little bit together. So Brian, Brian and I have been together for 15 years now. He started the company up in 2002, and I joined him in 05. And as you can tell, um, you know, he's the brains, and I'm the guy that does all the work, basically. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, you know, really, you know, Brian and I, we are total opposites. It's a yin-yang relationship, right? I'm very high energy. He's very focused. He's the visionary, and I'm the guy that's like, how much is this going to cost? Right? So we had a marriage here that's worked out extremely well for the two of us in regards to what we built. And what we're building is really an industry, and that's the fun part of what we do. Right? Dairy itself started trading in 1997, so it's relatively young. Granted, you know, it's 20 years ago, but it's relatively young when you look at it from some of the other commodities. And Brian and I have been fortunate to be a part of it since the very beginning of time. Right? So, from a standpoint of here, you got two Chicago kids that walk out and try to get into this dairy business. So how do you start building the business? So we had our little niche on the trading floor at the time, which allowed us to attract some of these larger companies that are in the industry that if we were in some other industry called energy or, or grains, they wouldn't even talk to us. But here, we're viewed as pioneers trying to create and build this new futures industry in the dairy industry. So because of that, the industry really wanted to see us succeed. And this is where we became fortunate, is they took us under their belt. 
They allowed us to come in and, and see how cheese is actually made, how butter is actually made. We're allowed to go on to dairy farms and see how milk is done from various parts of the country, not only in the United States, but across the globe. I mean, it opened up doors and windows that we could have never done in any other industry, and it's allowed us to do it here in dairy. So it's really been a fun part of what we've been doing here. Obviously, we're for profit. We would like to grow, and all of us like to make money at the end of the day. But for us, it's about fun and really having a passion for something. And for us, it's about growing this dairy risk management industry. So it starts off what we've done in brokerage, and over time, it's evolved into these other entities that we have today as well dairy technology. Again, the reason why that was built was to make our brokers sharper what they do in managing risk. And by allowing that, it opened up more doors into other areas of revenues and, and sources of growth. And then taking it a step further, as new products come online that relate back to managing risk from an area perspective, the insurance, it was such a natural transition for us to be a part of that as well. And to be on the ground level, not only from a standpoint of bringing on customer dairyman business to, to start doing insurance, but educating. Educating them correctly on how they should be managing their risk, not only with an insurance product, but also utilizing software as well as what's out there on the exchange. So it's been a really fun ride for us, right? I mean, we're a relatively young company. We've got about 28 employees between the, the three companies. Our two wives still work for our companies. Mine's in accounting, his is in HR. And it's really family first for us, right? We have a lot of fun doing what we do, and I can't emphasize that. We don't just go out and bring people on and have a revolving door. You know, when we bring people on, we want them to be with us for the long haul. Because we are dealing with some major, major corporations, and just like any other company, we have image risk. I'm not a Yahoo by any stretch. I'm not a CME group by any stretch. We are rice dairy, and in the dairy industry, that carries a little bit of weight. And we definitely have to have the right image with our personnel and our people and who we are as an organization to make sure that we live up to this image that we've established over the years. So we are very selective of who we bring on board because we want to make sure we're bringing on the right people that have the same vision and drive as we do, that have the same passion and the same heart that we do in this industry and want to have fun doing it as well. I mean, that's the key here, right? In the world, the, the way the industry has evolved, even in the last five years, in our sector especially, it's just like this, it's staggering. And we're trying to keep up constantly, and that's why we're out here as well, is to see what else is out there that we should be doing as an organization. How should we be attracting talent and so forth? Because we're not here just for 15 years, we're going to be here for the next 15 years. And by doing so, this is the reasons why we're coming out, telling you folks, what the dairy industry is about. And in essence, hopefully you can kind of see what we're doing and maybe try to strike some excitement within you to be a part of our industry in one fashion or another. Um, so I think that's pretty much covered everything on that dance part. Yeah, I think, that's, uh, I think that's good. I mean, we can talk about uh, how we have grown, how we've grown our team. We talked about the team quite a bit there. Um, one, of our, one of our early uh, we're excited to visit you, as Pete's saying here, to meet maybe students that are looking for careers afterward. Uh, that's been one of the things we've been really lucky and we've worked hard at over the years. Um, initially, what Rice Dairy needed most was people that had a desire to work in a future business, because that was our core business and it still is. And we found a program at the University of Idaho where, similar to, to this, they're kind of cross-pollinating ideas. They had math and computer science, business school, and ag school. And kids would self-select their way into these programs where they'd take classes on futures and options and derivatives, ultimately uh, come up with a trading idea, present this idea in front of the board, and if the board okayed it, these kids would trade live futures. Okay, so they would feel what it was like to lose a couple thousand dollars on a trade. That's a big difference versus paper trading. So if they made it all the way through that process and graduated, there's a high likelihood they would be okay in our shop. We've got three of those vandals that are still in our company today. <clears throat> One of them is a, a vice president of our commercial desk. Um, and then the other side of our business too is farm facing. And Pete and I found out a while ago that a couple guys from Chicago, who, even though we know the business, we walk out of a dairy farm and the dairy farmer's skeptical. He's like, you Chicago bastard, how are you going to get in my pocket somehow? And it's just the nature of the way the world works. So we recruited dairy farm kids. And today, one of those dairy farm kids is the vice president of our company as well. 
a part owner of our software business. Um, and we've got a group of those folks, guys and gals now working for us that grew up on farms. And they go out and they are the face to our dairy farm customer base. Um, and something else that we learned, another piece that has really worked for us, and Pete and I both worked at a place called Iowa Grain Company. And when we worked there, that was a company of maybe 150 people. Clearing house, based on the Board of Trade. But they competed very well against ADMs and car in the world. And the reason they did it was they very strategically got a holistic view of supply and demand and information. So we took that DNA and it's in our company now as well. So our customer base, we have about a thousand customers, as Pete was talking, kind of spans the world, spans the whole value chain. But it's not accidental. We looked at kind of the key pinch points of the global value chain. We said, we need customers, we need contacts in those spaces. So that when we're talking to that dairy farmer in Wisconsin, what he's getting from us is a real-time view. We are aggregating information and data, processing out the garbage, and creating a signal for our customers. What is the data that actually matters? What is the information and the signals that actually matter? Uh, and that allows us to stay on the front end, it's why our customers pay us. Uh, the customer is going to open an account at a discount brokerage company for free, basically. We trade for free. Uh, we charge a much higher price. Our customers are paying for what's between our ears. Okay? It's, we're, we have a feel for what's going on in the market. We get a feel for what their risk is. And it's kind of a conversation of, guys, if we were in your shoes, these are the kind of positions we'd be adjusting right now. Uh, but at the heart of our business, because our value is in our heads, it's all about our team. Right? We don't have machines, we don't have a factory, it's all about our team. That's the entirety of our company. Um, any other history or in there or something interesting for us? And anybody fire away questions, by the way, too, if you have. Uh, yeah. yeah. One is about the crop insurance you were talking about and then the dairy insurance. I'm not real familiar with dairy insurance, but just thinking about that with the, um, the the risk on the crop insurance is a lot of weather risk. You know, it's really not insuring you against being a bad farmer. In dairy, what's the what's the risk that you're insuring against there in terms of them not making it's all around price on, on the market side or how's that work? It is. That's yeah. that's a good question. It, in crop, as I understand it, we're not experts there, but it's roughly half uh, yield risk and half price risk. So when the corn farmer buys that crop insurance, if the price falls down, he gets a payout, an indemnity payout from the insurance. Or if there's hail that wipes out his yield, he can get a payout on yield loss as well. Um, in dairy, most of the cows are in a barn. So if, if you took a pie chart of what crop insurance looks like, it's maybe half price and half yield. If you did the same thing for dairy, it would be like 95% price, 5% yield. There's just way less yield variation in dairy. Uh, I've been told, if you take a cynical view, I've been told the only reason they put a yield component on the dairy insurance is so that it qualify as a crop insurance product. Uh, but there is yield risk, and we just had our first settlement yesterday. Uh, for the, the very first uh, settlement of any of these insurance for dairy, and the yield is playing a factor. Nothing like that it doesn't crop, but it's a factor. Um, yeah, I think too, Laura, yeah. Brian, you talked a little bit when we were walking around, we heard about the robotics and automation and dairy operations and how that's changed and maybe made it a little bit more predictable, I would imagine. Is that true of what the yield's going to be because of less human and more automation? Yeah, that's uh and just last week, I was at a conference for a company called Lely. They're a Dutch company, but they are the leading company in robotic uh, milking. And it's, it's a game changer on, on the dairy farm sector. It's going to be the pathway to increased yields. You know, you look at what corn yields have done over a lot of years. I'm not sure how many ag people we have in here, but uh, when the scientists and engineers really focus on how you're going to crank up yield, and there's a lot of room in dairy production, and one of them is coming from these robots. Uh, in a standard dairy farm, what happens is they round up the cows, they bring them to the parlor, and they milk them, and 
we talk to a dairy farmer, we'll be like, do you milk two or three times a day? Do that process twice or three times a day. In a robotic barn, there is no rounding up. The cow walks up to the robot whenever she wants. When she goes in, it drops feed down for her, she eats, uh, cleans her, milks her. When she's done, she walks away. Yield is, in, yield is doubled. Um, and these robotic milkers, they, I was at their conference last year, they cannot keep up with orders. So I talked to the CEO for a minute, and I'm like, you know, the labor shortage from the Trump administration seems to be quite a boost. He's like, we were going to go either way. If it was Hillary, they would jack up the minimum wage. If it was Trump, they're, you know, taking away the workers. It's not just that technology. There's a real strain on labor on the farm, labor availability and cost. So for all these reasons, it's going toward robotic. From our standpoint, we are in the process of, of, of integrating our software with these robots. And what's so exciting about that, anyone here is in uh, software engineering, computer science in any way, shape, or form? A couple of people, okay. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So as smart as we build our software, what is going into it matters a lot. And with these robotic milkers, we're getting the data straight off what's <coughs> straight off the animal. What's the production? What are the components? The components are the commodities that we trade. Fat and protein. How much is coming off that animal in real time? So the data is pristine, it's real time, it's exciting. Um, <clears throat> and it's definitely changing the, the production sector, like I say. We're probably less than 5% of the milk in the US right now is from robots. I think anybody who's looking forward is going to say 50 years from now we're going to be all robots. Um, certainly any new barns that are being built in the U.S., people are at least considering robots if not. It's, it's almost getting to the point of becoming a no-brainer on the production side. Yeah. In terms of you go to the grocery store and you see some milk, uh, but then you see all sorts of different types of milk, cashew milk, uh, soy milk, uh, you know, almond milk, and, and uh, I guess what do you see, uh, obviously still a small slice compared to the dairy industry, but what do you see changing and, and how do you see, do you see an evolving market for your services and any of that? Our dairy farmers call that, all that stuff nut juice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, but it's a real threat and the dairy companies are getting into the game. They're, they're buying those businesses as well. Um, it's so interesting. When you talk about consumer trends, it's not just about science, right? It's about what do people feel and what do they want. Uh, that, that's such an interesting game. Um, like I said, the dairy farm at the cooking industry is saying, we got to get into that space because it's growing. Uh, the farmers are saying, we got to compete with that. And, you know, I think their marketing message is kind of interesting. And what they're starting to revolve around, instead of trying to crush it and say it's not juice, it's terrible, it's not as good. What you're seeing them say is that uh, milk is something that uh, Mother Nature has created over 200 million years. Uh, it's a perfectly formed food that all mammals naturally consume and it's impossible to recreate that in the laboratory. Um, and I think that's probably a smart marketing message to create the other thing as synthetic as opposed to the real thing. Uh, but it's definitely a growing category. The consumer trends are, are going for it. Not enough to create. In our world of like commodity trading, there is nobody running a fundamental model that's, that's uh, factoring in losses compared from these, from these things. Uh, it's more about, at the consumer level, it's an interesting thing our customers are paying attention to it. But it's not like creating a fair market at all because over half of the milk that's produced in the U.S. goes into making cheese. So only about a third of that total milk crop goes into what we drink. Um, so it's a sliver of a sliver that's getting pulled away. Yeah, I have that? to say, uh, you know, I think fluid consumption in general has been declining for the past 30 years, right? It's just been a constant. And now with these other plant-based and nut-based milks that are coming online, it's getting a little bit more getting a little bit more press, so to speak, out of the media, and it looks like it's really hampering something on the dairy milk in itself. But in all honesty, dairy, dairy itself has a lot of room to grow, and Brian just nailed it. It's more products that's based off of milk than fluid milk consumption in itself. 
So if you look at what we're doing with infant formula, if you look at what we're doing with butters, fat's attractive again. Everybody wants butter. You know, McDonald's went from using margarine to butter. I mean, that was a huge consumption base domestically in the United States. Because once McDonald's did it, Burger King does it, Wendy's does it. You know what I mean? It's a chain reaction. And then it, the industry has to adapt. Right? So from that standpoint, domestically, there's a lot of room to grow for dairy products, per se, even if fluid consumption is going down. But the bigger growth potential for the dairy industry with the United States, and we're the only ones that can really grow now, and Europe can as well, since they're all quota, but is really the export world. Since 2008, we really we were not into the export market until 2008, I should say, meaning that a lot of the dairy products that were getting produced were being consumed domestically, and whatever wasn't being consumed and prices would collapse, the government would buy. Well, the industry itself changed that landscape completely, and they got a little bit more progressive saying, what does the world like? What, how should we change flavor and taste and texture? And so that's what we started doing since 08, and really, really concentrated in Asia, and more specifically China. And quite honestly, if China were just to increase their cheese consumption by a quarter of a pound annually, we wouldn't be able to supply it. I mean, that's the tipping scale that if there's a change in diet in that, in that part of the world, that's how fast your milk prices can literally add 50 to 75 percent to it. Yes? How is the company adapting to have some current foreign, current trade policies in the United States? Yeah, I don't think it's I think we're in the same boat as everybody else. It's been an extreme challenge, right? We can't predict what trade wars are going to do and what tariffs are going to do specifically. We have ideas. We do modeling. We do forecasting. A lot of the damage has already been done, though. You know, um, I think Trump announced it, what, was it three years now? Uh, the Mexican tariffs and the yeah. walls and things of that nature. And so the dairy industry has already felt the pains of what we're still seeing in the news today, meaning that with Mexico, for instance, who is our biggest natural buyer in the export world, uh, powdered not fat dry milk as well as cheese. Uh, as soon as we started talking these trade wars and these tariffs, we felt it as an industry. The dairymen are feeling it now still today. It's been a straight collapse of pricing for the last three years that have kind of stabilized now and gotten to a point that prices are so low and consumption is starting to pick back up that even with tariffs, there's things that are happening within the world that the industry is now starting to come back and buy a little bit more aggressively. So to answer your question, those are shockers, right? Those are tremendous shockers, and they weren't good ones for the dairy industry. And unfortunately, the dairymen right now are still feeling the pains of it. And I think we're kind of turning the corner in regards to support pricing, for pricing for milk. I think you know, we're, we're on the lower end of the band, and I think we're kind of turning the corner because we're starting to see little pockets of the globe having some disruption in a fundamental aspect that are really starting to support prices domestically here. So it should start to see some retracement for dairy men for a better price moving forward. Okay. We actually think the uh, <clears throat> the emergence of crop insurance for dairy farmers happened, it launched in October of last year. A lot of people think that was a direct result of trade wars, prices collapse, the administration says farmers, I got your back. They go back into the USDA and say, what kind of tools do we have? So this dairy farm crop insurance got fast tracked. So there's a lot of there's like what is the price impact, but then there's also what does it do to things like that. Uh, you know, we didn't even I couldn't have imagined that this crop insurance would have emerged that fast. Uh, but it came up, and that was one of the things that changed. I, I think that was the result of the trade war stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah. Can you tell them a little bit more just about your entrepreneurial journey? So you came out of uh, large companies and decided to take the risk to launch this. Talk a little bit more about that decision process of how you go to, to take the risk yourself personally to start a company that now is going to work on risk management for others. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, uh, I had, by the time I, I started Rice Dairy in 2002, I had eight years of industry experience. Um, and I did not graduate college, so I, I consider those eight years my undergrad and my master's. Um, and by the time I was getting toward those eight years, uh, I was focused on agricultural markets. I had already decided that's what I really loved and that's what I was so interested in. Uh, that's where I met Pete and I were grain company. And while I was there, all of a sudden I see these dairy markets pop up. 
And the more I researched them, the more I got interested. From the scale of the commodity, to the complexity of it, uh, to, I'd seen futures markets that had been launched but failed, like uh, broiler chickens. Chickens are obviously a really big market, but that industry was so vertically integrated, you couldn't get a really uh, robust price signal coming out of there. It was just too, it was too controlled. Uh, dairy industry is like an Indian democracy. It is just a big mess, okay? So even if some player is the biggest player in fluid milk, it doesn't matter because there's also the cheese industry. And cheese is broken up into the big players in mozzarella, but they're not big players in cheddar. And then what does that mean for the yogurt guys? Well, those are totally different companies. So this source feedstock, which is milk, is split off into all these other industries that to me seemed like it couldn't be controlled by any one source. So, and again, it was so interesting. I got bit by the bug. The, the commodity was so complicated and interesting. I got excited. I grew up in a family of, uh, you know, a bunch of Chicagoans, a big family. My parents had a bar. <clears throat> my grandpa started a publishing company. My uncle had a, a boat repair company. My other uncle had a garden center. So everybody was already entrepreneurs. To me, it didn't even didn't even cross my mind. It was like just more a matter of what and when, as opposed to if I would do something like that. Um, so as, like I say, I started the research. I researched dairy hard for about a year, and leaned on people that I knew, mentors, that told me to create a business plan. They challenged the ideas. Uh, so by the time I actually did go off on my own, um, you know, there was obviously a lot of luck involved. But I did some of the hard work up front too to try and stack some odds in my favor. And, I, and I'll say this too, Pete and I have taken, Pete joined me as one of the best moves I've ever done. He, he tells me I sold him, I think he sold me on partnering together in 05. Um, but a couple things. One of the things that helped me get started too was I had been at the company I ran for four years. So I went from being an employee to a customer. When I started Rice Dairy, we were a customer of Iowa Grain. Pete was still there, he was on the inside, he helped me a lot. The company kind of helped uh, nurture me as a customer. And I think that came from goodwill. I earned some trust there over time. So the old adage, things like never burn a bridge, that, that paid off for me in a lot of ways. <clears throat> I think too, uh, we've got a lot of scars on our back. You know, I talk about our software business that we started. I talk about our insurance business that we started. There's a handful of things that we started that don't exist anymore. And they don't exist because they failed. Uh, if you take the model of what is Rice Dairy as a brokerage business, it is a, a special, right? We're not a jack of all trades. We specialize in dairy. We charge a premium in an emerging asset class. We took that model and we applied it to the carbon business. And it seemed when also there was carbon futures that got us in the US. And going into 2008, it seemed like cap and trade was going to happen in the U.S. and carbon would be a really big commodity. We invested a lot of time and money into that business. Not only a brokerage company did we set up, we launched a hedge fund. We got along a bunch of carbon assets. Uh, we got long at an average price of about $5 a ton. We were thinking it could go to about 30 where it was in Europe. Today they're worth zero. Um, we also launched a business in the U.K because the largest milk crop on earth is in Europe. And they deregulated about 15 years after the U.S. did it. We thought we could do this again. We can go build in Europe the same way we did here. We tried it four years, it grew. We actually learned a lot. We have customers there still. We closed out our office. It wasn't, wasn't working. Uh, multiple challenges. So the entrepreneurial journey, at least from my standpoint, I'll pass the mic to you as well, but um, it's, it's awesome. I love it. You've got to be willing to uh, cut bait when it's not working, as we have done. And I think, you know, part of the successes that we've had prior, especially in the insurance business, our willingness to take risk, calculated risk, uh, can hurt us sometimes, but it's definitely paid us in the long run. It's just the way we operate. Yeah, my path is a little bit different, total opposite of Brian. So my mom and dad were immigrants here, so I was first generation born, right? And uh, my parents were not even grammar school educated. 
And for them, it was always about working for a company, right? Getting a good job, getting that salary, getting that benefit, getting nine to five, and so forth and so forth. So that was my mindset growing up through the years. And even being in the futures industry, when you looked outside that box, the opportunity was much greater. But I was always focused on the company level. Um, I, as well, we joke about this, the two owners, I did not go to college. Uh, I started running down on the trading floor in uh, 1987. And back then, it was a lot different than it is today. Um, the year I was down there was the year of the 1987 crash. Um, absolutely amazing. And the following year was the 1988 drought that we encountered here in the United States. And so I saw a lot of wealth grow and get depleted immediately. I seen grown men crying on the trading floor to guys physically doing drugs on the trading floor. I mean, it was that type of atmosphere that was back then. That, and as soon as I was down there, and I was a runner at the time, I had a yellow coat. And being a runner, you are the grunt. You're running in there and you're trying to shove an order in somebody's face and say, hey, you got to fill this for my customer. And you're getting elbowed and pushed and prodded and so forth. And, you know, after two years of going through that, I said, ah, there's nothing else in this world I want to do. I want to be in this industry. Right? So I applied myself where I can to grow and try to get an education. And, you know, Brian alluded to, I worked at various companies, but I was always, I always gravitated towards agriculture. Right? And it's very true, agricultural people are, are, are different, right? Financial industries are, are extremely different. Um, just the way that the culture is, the way that people are focused and so forth, where it truly is different in the agricultural community, being much more genuine. Not saying that they're not good business people, they're extremely great business people. It's just a different mindset in the way they do business, and I've always gravitated towards that. So I worked at a lot of agricultural companies, and when Brian and I met was at Iowa Grain, and at Iowa Grain, I was in charge of sales, I ran operations, um, I built a couple of companies up for our mother company division, so to speak, of what Brian was building. And at that time, as Brian alluded, he went off on his own, and we helped him, and then I got wooed to go to this other company at the time. Um, it was one of the biggest non-banking clearinghouses in the United States to run institutional sales. And Brian followed me as a customer. And uh, I would say about six months into my tenure there with Brian being with me, him and I are at a bar, we're having a drink, we're talking about it, and as he indicated, and he sold me, and I'm like, okay, fine. I go home, look at my wife, and I said, look, at, you know, I'm making all this money, and I'm doing really well, but guess what? We're going to sell the house because we need cash, and I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to partner up with this guy, and I'm going to take a run at going after Gary. And uh, surprisingly enough, my wife's like, go for it. And long story short, you know, uh, we both had our personal struggles building this company, but I alluded to earlier, you know, we're lucky in the aspect that, you know, we brought something to the industry that they didn't see before. And that was a couple of passionate guys that actually had an ag background and understand how to manage and risk, and we were trying to present that to the dairy industry. So the industry wanted to see us succeed. That's the key here. They wanted to see growth. They wanted to manage risk because at the time, they just couldn't. There wasn't enough volume, right? There wasn't enough infrastructure to support that volume. And it was guys like us that had to come in and try to build this infrastructure to support it and grow it. So by default, we grew, right? I mean, we, are, we weren't out to be the biggest brokerage company in the United States. That's just by default. Our goal has always been to grow the dairy industry, and that's what our goal is still today. Right? I mean, we represent in the dairy, the insurance industry, in our short history of time, we've been in business for six months. Yep. We re represent about 6% of the national herd. We're not insurance guys. Right? But we have something here that the industry wants. They, they understand it. They see it. That's why they gravitate towards us. Right? It's the same thing in the brokerage business. I mean, we're just a couple of guys providing a service that somebody else wasn't to build the industry. That's our goal when we got together. That's our goal of what we're doing today. And all the products that we roll out, whether it's in carbon trading, whether it's in in the, United, excuse me, in the United Kingdom, whether it's in our technology, really it's, it's a focus still based off of our core of what we do in brokerage. Right? I mean, that's really what Brian and I do extremely well is manage risk. And so, yeah, with me, it was, it was more of a matter of uh, really going from one degree to another. And I got to tell you what, mom and dad were not happy. They were not happy with me. Um, but yeah, I think now they're okay with it. But, uh, it's been a good ride. We've been, again, very blessed and fortunate. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. It really is. I mean, I'm, I'm a passionate guy. I think you guys can kind of see that in my voice. And i got to tell you, I mean, it's fun watching 
folks like yourselves coming in as interns, from interns coming employees, from employees getting married, having children, becoming VPs of our company. It's, I mean, it's fun, you know? It's part of your family. And quite honestly, what we do, you got to have fun. We're together all the time. We joke about it. I mean, he's basically my second wife. I'm with him more than I am with my actual. But at the end of the day, it's him and I are, are so wired to succeeding. Right? To, to not fail. If we do fail, learn from our failures and continue to just grow and have fun doing it. When you don't have fun doing something, guys, stop doing it. Seriously. It's all about having fun. There's so much more to life than money. It's about what you're doing. It's about having fun. It's about, for us, growing an industry. I mean, that's what we're doing here today. So, again, you know, put all your, your little morals in place. But number one, family first, fun second, always. <coughs> On that, we're going to wrap. Thank you Thank so you. much.